I'm not going to tell you to stop drinking. If you, like I had a little glass of wine at night, I'm not going to tell you that. That's what I'm here for, okay? I'm not going to be one of the temperance preachers. I'm not going to be Charles Finney or one of those people of the past. So I'm going to try to go through this as fast as possible, only because you might, you know, I talk too much. <laughs> and so, that, so, that's, so that's what's going to go on here. So we're, we're moving ahead. Now the first one, the language, and just to tell you with that, is the way to express an idea. So the ideas are going to be expressed differently. So that's what language is all about. The rest are kind of self-explanatory, and you don't need to know all that. But you'll see that throughout the program, I hope, okay, if I can get that across to you. And the tendency for me sometimes is to jump around. So you have to bear with me, okay? And please, please do. But anyway, here we are. Canal water, whiskey, and temperance. Now, a lot of the information I got is from uh, a book called, and for some information I got, I should say, uh, uh, Canal Water and Whiskey by uh, Mr. Rat. Okay, and the copyright date of the book is 1992. And what he does is talk about legends, folklore, any some fact stuff that really, and he backs up some of the folklore with that. So I borrowed some of those ideas from him and employed it to what I wanted to, what I wanted to do. So there, the first two pictures you have here is a man who's drinking nothing but water, and you can read that he's over his grave, and people are going to think well of him because he stopped drinking, right? <laughs> and then we have Francis Willard, and Francis Willard is going to be one of the uh, starters of the WCTU, okay, the Women's Christian uh, Temperance Union. So that's, and she's involved in suffrage and all that. Now, in the bottom there, I just want to put some background down, then we're, we're, we're moving on. You see, there were two rebellions in the United States of America. One was heavily armed, okay. Now, the reason why I put the two rebellions down Shay's Rebellion is because whiskey had something to do with the rebellion. And when the reason for it was, this was under what we call the Articles of Confederation. That was our first constitution. It was a weak constitution. And it's going to cause a rebellion. Okay, so one of the things that happened in Shay's Rebellion was the fact that after the, after the American Revolution, people who were doing trade, found it, found it impossible to pay off their debts. And one reason why they found it impossible to pay off their debts was because the people in Europe did not want credit. They wanted cash on the line. And that caused a problem. And the real big problem was, one of the biggest problems was whiskey. There were Hundreds, you won't believe this, but there were hundreds of distilleries in the original colonies. And those distilleries could not pay off because what they were doing, what the farmers were doing, was converting their crop to whiskey because that was a mode of buying stuff, trade. That became money, that became cash in a sense. So they couldn't use that. And so a man by Daniel Shea, uh, organizes an army of about 4,000 people. And this is going to be, it has to be, and the state could not handle it by themselves. The federal government certainly couldn't handle it. So finally a whole bunch of militias got together and put down the rebellion. But there was a rebellion. And the next one's going to take place then when our constitution was signed in 1789. Another rebellion. This is not going to be as violent. But it's going to last a couple of years. And this is the one where George Washington is, President of the United States. And what he does, again, whiskey. Whiskey is going to be the thing that's going to be bartering things here. The farmers in western Pennsylvania or beyond were converting their crop into whiskey, mainly whiskey, okay? Sometimes beer. But beer doesn't last as long in a barrel as whiskey would last. So they were doing whiskey and that became a mode of, here, I'll give you, I'll give you whiskey, you give me uh, four dozen of eggs or whatever you have to do. So that was, that was the thing. Now what George Washington did, because they had to pay off the debts, the debts 
you know, we talk about debts even now, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Some situations don't change at all, okay? They had to pay off their debts uh, to all that, all those foreign governments that helped pay for the, helped pay for the revolution, okay? So he said, ah, he says, what are we gonna do? We're gonna tax whiskey. Mm -hmm. Oh man, the ragged farmers up in Europe, <laughs> especially in Western New York. So this rebellion is gonna last about two years. Thankfully, it did not end in great violence. It was put down, though. They had, to, they had to put an army together to show the eight guys, you better go home and behave yourselves. And they said, oh, yeah, we better go home. And they did, okay? The, the farmers weren't going to cause much problem. Now, obviously, there's much more of these, uh, these, uh, these revolutions and all. So this is the background. Whiskey is important. It's important to, to Americans at this particular time. Uh, what about whiskey now? Now, you, you can't, can't throw away whiskey to you unless we talk about the Irish, okay? Now, I'm not insulting the Irish. I want you to know that. I see some of you here, okay? And I, become, you know, I, I want to walk out of here tonight. All right, so at any rate, so here's whiskey. And I'm not even going to try to say that in Gaelic, but there it is. And in Gaelic, it means whiskey is really the water of life. That's the translation of that, okay? So I was trying to say that a couple of times. I forget how to say it, so I said the heck with it. All right, that's Gaelish. All right, now look at how the uh, consumption was, okay? 1830, now the canal's already been completed. 1825, the, the original canal. It's already been completed, but American alcohol consumption. Look at this, the person consumed an average of five gallons of distilled liquor each year. Ah, okay. Each man, therefore, would be drinking four or five shots per day. Can you imagine? Four or five shots a day? And but in the early 1800s, hard cider and whiskey were the mainstay of American drink. Now, why is that? Well, you couldn't trust water. And these people that came from Europe, you couldn't trust their water. So when they got here, what's, what's the best thing to do? You drink what you, what you could manufacturers in a sense, okay? Now here in Minnesota, for instance, well, the first, uh, on the, uh, I gotta get this right, if I get it wrong, it's too bad. But uh, <laughs> on the, <laughs> on the, uh, on the, okay, on the south side of the canal now, okay? There were, on the south side of the canal, earlier, orchards were planted. Guess what kind of orchards? Apple. Apple, sure, apple orchards, okay? And on the other side of the canal, on the other side of the canal, I'm going to reverse it. On the north side of the canal was the apples. On the south side of the canal was grains. Wheat, basically wheat, okay? So now you have two products. Okay, one product is going to make hard cider. The other product is going to make, guess what? Whiskey. All right, or gin, maybe. Okay, there's a difference between the two. Not that I know, but, okay. So hard cider, 15 gallons of hard cider. Now we're talking 15 gallons of hard cider of capita of consumption. Besides, we're talking about the still. So people were drinking a lot. Let's put it that way, okay? So there we are in that situation. Now, here comes the Irish. And we're gonna talk about the Irish in a, in a good sense. Now, just so you know, the Irish were subjugated. They were, they were used, okay? The hardest parts of building the canal were built by the Irish. Why? Nobody else wanted to do it. Why? They needed to work. Why? Because <laughs> they just needed to work, and they did. Okay? Now, some Irish, there were two groups of Irish, obviously, right? You can see that from the coloring I put up there, right? The orange and the, the green. Sometimes they didn't get along each other, with each other. Now, one good reason why to, to, whiskey was so important, not only because the, the placate then, because basically whiskey came from Ireland. It started in Ireland in the 12th century by, a monk, by a, uh, an Irish monk. They were making perfumes, and he decided to 
put some alcohol and perfume, and then they decided to drink a little bit. They said it was pretty good, and eventually they, they did this. So it, so, it came, it, so it came along in time. So eventually, hundreds of distilleries in Ireland, hundreds of distilleries in Ireland. And so then the king decided that uh, well, that's a good idea, and I think we'll tax them. So we, we ended up with legal, legal whiskey and illegal whiskey. So that's become part of their culture too. So when they come here, what do they bring with them? Their culture. They don't trust the water they're going to drink. So we're going to drink it. Part of their contracts, even when they were in New York City, when they got off the boat, like for instance, Camus White, who helped build the canal, an early engineer, he went all the way to New York. He said, I'm going to recruit the Irishmen to come here because he couldn't get the local native to necessarily work beyond their own territory, beyond their own contracts here. And part of the contract was, you're going to get so many jiggers of whiskey. You work here during the day, you're going to get, you're going to get your whiskey thing. And that was always part of the contract, because, because they needed it. Okay? Now, in, in, in this year, we're talking about like the Montezuma Swamps. And one of the canal commissioners was named uh, Myron uh, Howley. Uh, he becomes one of the famous commissioners of the canal. And that's what he's doing here. He puts an advertisement in. Now, let's not forget that there were newspapers came along early in our country. People wanted to know what was going on, as people did know what was going on, because almost every area ended up with a newspaper. Mm -hmm. And so now you end up with newspapers, you know what's going on. So he's going to advertise. He's not going to be the worker. He's the guy who's going to hand out the monies to all these contractors, OK? So Myron, Myron, don't mind me. Sorry, Mr. Holly, I'll call you Myron. All right, but everybody, Myron's going to advertise. Now, if you really, really read the fine print there, I know you can't very well. But he tells them why you're going to get the wonderful meals, you know, even though it might have a lot of magnets in it, you know. Mm -hmm. You're going to get, you're going to get beautiful meals. And everything we read about us sometimes in history, we think that, God, they're going to have a great time when, when they're out working because they're going to get good meals. Well, they didn't always get good meals. They got some. But part of why every, every one of those things was, where's my whiskey? All right? And that became part of the contract. Now, let's not forget the fact that some of these Irishmen, many of the Irishmen came here, and some people called them indentured servants. They came here. Okay? Some of them were forced to come here. They were not indentured servants. They were indentured servants, but they were almost like slaves. In other words, here's what you're going to do, and here's where you're going to work. You're going up, and you're going to help build the Erie Canal. You're going to, there's canal work here. Now, some of them already had knowledge of how to build the canal. Because if you go to Great Britain, the whole area, right, got canals. And they, they helped build canals. So some of the Irish that came here built, knew how to build the canal. They knew how to work. They knew how to work. They were workers. Outstanding workers. So here we are. Here we get seven shillings. Now, if you go to the museum and you, in our museum here, and there's a thing about railroads, and if you want to take, if you want to take a ride on the, uh, on the, on the railroad going from uh, Albany to Schenectady, uh, it costs you two shillings mm. because you see, states in the United States, every still couldn't accept the money system very well. So now we're still using European ideas. Shillings, what shillings? You, we talk dollars and cents, don't we? <laughs> and then he, we even broke down dollars and cents into half cents. Because that's, it, was, it became complicated, our, our, our system. So they would work here. You notice they're gonna get, they're gonna get something uh, in the tavern. Guess what they're going to get in the tavern? Your promise, you're going to get beautiful stuff, all right? Uh, medical care, free whiskey, and if you got the shakes while you were in the Montezuma swamps, you're going to get more whiskey. <laughs> because whiskey is going to become a cure. All right, so, so they're working there. So now, now, the reason why I put two colors up there, obviously, because it's two Irish. And sometimes, you've got the Irish Protestant and you got the Irish Catholic. Green Catholic. Protestant, Irish. And they had to work side by side. And one reason why whiskey was given to them 
is to keep them calm. The same reason why, as Frederick Douglass said at one time, if you want not have a, a slave revolt, you give them drink. Keep them calm. Okay? And by the way, you can see later in the slide, uh, Frederick Douglass is going to be one of the uh, people for the Temperance Union. And so a whole lot of blacks are going to be part of the Temperance Union. We don't see that in their history books. We always see Victorian type people, you know, oh, you had nice white people, and, and there they are, and they're, they, they're the ones that made the changes here. Okay, well, you're going to see a little bit of that later on. Okay, so we'll move on, because I don't want to spend a lot of time and a lot of things, so I want to get you home. Okay? But if you're here at 10 o'clock, be patient. <laughs> <laughs> All right, now here we go. All right. This is, now, this is part legend. What you see up there is part legend, okay? And that was, the canal had to be completed. It is now going to be October 26, 1825, when the canal is going to be opened up, right? But it wasn't completed. And it wasn't completed for the last 17 miles, and that's after Lockport. Okay, by the way, Kansas Soda had a lot to do with Lockport because our engineer came from there who engineered the Lockport rocks, okay? I have to say something about him. All right, that's all I'm going to say now. All right, so what's happened here? Now, some of this is legend, but beside, behind every legend is some fact, and you've got to examine the facts, okay? So here we are, and we're talking about 17 miles. The last 17 miles, you had, you had to connect to the Buffalo River, the Niagara River, in Lake Erie. And you got a deadline. The governor's coming. There's going to be a whole lot of barges and stuff on their way to New York to put the barrel, in the, a barrel into the ocean from Lake Erie. It's not completed. Who do you get? You get the Irishman. And what do you do? Somewhat legend. There's a lot of truth in it. All right? You put a, you put a barrel of whiskey in intervals. <laughs> See, work was going too slow. So you, built, you put it in barrels along the way. If you get to the barrel, you guys, the workforce, okay, you're usually like with, with three in, in a group, all right? If you get to that barrel, you can start emptying it. And that's what he did. The canal was completed in that time. Okay, <laughs> completed in that time. All right, now, fine. So you had what you call a jigger boss. And he usually was a young man. And he went around, and I'm talking about other times during when the canal was being built. And he went around all the time, okay, it's time for your allowance. What's the allowance? The allowance is whiskey. The allowance is whiskey. So here's the whiskey. So now you go, he's got, he's got what they call uh, a jigger. All right, that's, you're going to get so much, okay? Now, just imagine this. A half, a half a gill of whiskey times 16. 16 times a day, you got a half a gill of whiskey. By the end of the day, one gill is four ounces. By the end of the day, you drank a quart of whiskey. Yeah. How uh, whiskey had something to do with the building of the canal? A lot to do about the building of the canal. Did had whiskey to do a lot about the building of the United States of America? You bet, because it wasn't for the Erie Canal. Guess what? There'll be no United States of America as you know it today. So, there we are. Now, up on the top is a, what they call a soul cart. Now, I got this from Peter Spears' book because I read about a soul cart. And that was one way, it was an invention it was most likely made in this last 17 miles. How are we going to get the beer kegs <laughs> and maybe lumber, okay? So they came up with a new way of doing it, but you only take two guys and make sure the barrels got to the place. So there it is up at top, and I took this from the drawings of Peter's space book, the Erie Canal, okay? So Peter Spears book. Okay, so that was the soul car, and you notice what's on the soul car? <laughs> two kegs of whiskey. All right? We're going to get one place to the other, take the two people to do it. So all through the building of the canal, not only did they make inventions to make the canal easier to build, ordinary people made those inventions by it. 
by the way. Not the engineers, okay, the ordinary people. A lot of them were Irish, a lot of them were Welsh, a lot of them were other peoples going around here. So they have a building. So now, there they go. And a rhino was the uh, else people idea of what money was. They, they, they called it money, real money, rhino. Okay? That's, that's just a term I just wanted to throw up there. Because we're talking about money. We're talking about things to be traded. Okay? So anything that you can get cash for was called a rhino. Okay? Not the animal, but I, I don't know where it came from, but that's never been less. It might have been one of the Irishmen who did it. Okay? One of the Irishmen who did it because they needed the cash. I always got to make sure I press the right button. All right, now, here's the canal. The canal's completed, right? It's the super highway, it's the throughway of the period of time. And why was it the super highway? Because it became a super highway, new religions took place along the way. We're gonna talk about that in a little while about the Great Awakening. All right, so what happens here? It's, you got people exchanging ideas. You got people going east, you got people going west. And by the way, uh, the painting up on top is Neil Henry painting that we have a copy of in the a nice, beautiful painting in the museum. So come and pay us a visit sometime and look at the rest of the yard. So we had the superhighway of the 19th century proved to be the spread of new religion and new ideas because people are exchanging ideas. Right? You don't exchange ideas unless you get to meet somebody. You see, people on the frontier, they were all by themselves. They didn't get a chance to meet other people. And they were thriving, and that's going to be part of another part of this talk. They were thriving to meet other people, to be social. They didn't know it. As soon as the canal came by, wow, okay, we got we, we got somebody to talk to. Okay? And we're gonna, you know, we're gonna do it. And by the way, the people up on top are reading Friends. That's the Quaker newspaper. Newspapers were around. Okay, this is from Peter Spears' book. And I just want to uh, this would be a family barge, okay, a family barge. Notice with one of the main tr transportation with the human transport, whiskey, mm -hmm. amongst other things. Very important for trade at the time, okay. And a lot of times along with natural waterways, the barrels would be piled up for somebody to pick up. That was the, that was the, the spot to, to put, put, put them there in order for a barge to come by. Now, they were limited. You're going to see pictures in a little while where we come up with a different time and you see the amount of barrels that are going to be out there. But here we are, a family. Notice they're transporting, not just lumber, they're transporting. But notice the, the jugs way down in the bottom there. Right? And you're right. Okay, oh, yeah. notice the jugs. Okay, those are individual jugs. Guess what's in them? Yeah, you got it. <laughs> All right, I don't need to tell you any more than that. But now we get the canal, okay, in itself. Because what caused the temperance movement? And even while the temperance movement's going on, there's parts of the canal that are really wild. As a matter of fact, all parts of the canal were really wild. But two particular places, and they ended up with the nickname, the Barbary Coast Saloons. Barbary Coast Saloons only because of what they were doing. And so here's what was happening at the time. All right? Anybody? You all know where Waterville Elite is, all right? On your way to Albany? Okay. Waterville Elite is going to be one of the two Barbary Saloon areas. Within, within the, the two blocks, 25 saloons were within two blocks. And you can imagine what else we got went on there. I don't need to say it. Okay? Now, the reason why water relief became important, a little canal history here, is because the city of Troy did not, were, felt that they were being denied the true benefits of the canal. So they helped building what they call a side cut. The side cut was built in order to avoid the Albany Basin, so they could go directly into the Hudson. 
So they wanted to do that. And so what happens was it was built at Water Valite. So you go through Water Valite, it's got quite a history. <laughs> it's got a big history. Okay? So you can see what went on there. And some of the some of the places like the black rag and the tub of blood, okay, was the name of some of the saloons. And it was a whole saloon, whole bunch of things. The bloody, the bloody place to be. Uh, it had all kinds of things going on there, okay? So the next place is going to be Buffalo. And Buffalo is going to be major, okay? Just look at the maps here. All right, what you see up on top is an 1893 map put on by a Christian organization. And they're showing the houses of ill fame in the Canal District. And down below on your right hand side, you see a depiction of the Canal Street area. Now, 93 saloons, 15 concert hall dives. 400 women of easy virtue. I wonder what that means. <laughs> okay? And sometimes those women were called cooks. <laughs> I need to hire a cook for my dive. Okay? So, you know, and I, I'm not telling you a lie. Buffalo Listen, girls, what you're talking about tonight. <laughs> you want to come up here and sing that? <laughs> okay. Very good. And that's what that's all about. That, you know, people, they sing that, right? But they don't know the real history behind it. I mean, if you read each verse of that, you'll catch on if you want to. You'll catch on what he's really talking about. You know, hey, Buffalo Girls, you're going to come out tonight. And that's where they are. Okay. <laughs> ah. Now, the canal system, once the canal system was completed back for what it was in those days, okay? Completed from Canada down to Lake Champlain, down to the Hudson, connected to the Erie Canal, okay? Whiskey distilleries are going to change. What's going to happen to them? Up to that time, once the canal was completed, up to that time, individual distilleries were in operation. Without necessary competing each other, because everybody wanted whiskey. But once the canal met the system and they were completed, what happened was monopoly. You don't use that term in any anything, but I'm going to use it. What happened was monopoly because what happened was big time distilleries operated. You know how they they're buying out some of the crap beer today by now some of the craft organizations, mm -hmm. okay? And that's the same thing's gonna happen here. Okay, I can't compete against them. Okay, I can't compete against them, so I'm shutting down my, my brewery, or not just brewery, I'm distillery, mostly distilleries, some breweries. There was breweries around, okay? But remember, beer is hard to keep, not as good as, as whiskey. So, here we have it. Now that's gonna, that's gonna make for social change. Because all these rural farmers now, have not, they no longer rely on hard spirits. They're gonna become part of the temperance union, temperance movement, I should have said. Okay, they're gonna become part of the temperance movement very easily. Rural, what do we do? Well, I don't want anything to do with that. So they're going to become part of the temples. And they're going to become part of what we see in a little while. Camp meetings. And, and they're going to re relate to the temperance movement, okay? Because people are looking for something. But here's what I have here. And if you read this, canal transportation was appropriate if you didn't need a car to go in a hurry. That's when the Barge Canal was built. Okay? Barge Canal is built now. But whiskey is still going to be important. Okay, even in 1918, 100 years after the Erie Canal got started. Okay, we have the Barge Canal. And so people pre prohibition are going to be, distilleries are going to be shipping by a canal. Still important here. So look how much money is involved. Liquid gold, 
all right? Nearly perfect cargo, because it didn't spoil, was whiskey. So a single barrel could carry, a single barge could carry 500 barges, so-called modern day, 20th century. 500 barrels of whiskey, 50 gallons, there's a little more than 50 gallons in a, in a barrel, in a keg, a, a barrel rather than a keg, okay? A little more than that, but look how much it was worth. One dollar per quart retail, that's a hundred thousand dollars of boat load. That's a lot of money. So that else is still important, okay? A lot of money. Whiskey's still important. Still important to the view of the cow. What you see up on top is a schooner with a sail on it. And that became important in Lake Champlain. And one big reason why it became important in Lake Champlain, Champlain because it trans you didn't need, there was no tow pads. All right? You just, you just you got in a boat, and these were barges, and then they lowered down, lower the sail down, and guess what you had? A regular barge. They go on the regular canal and be pulled, be pulled by a tow path or what have you. All right, so now we have a connection with Canada. Canadian whiskey. Okay, you see what's going to happen here, okay? And there you see a family boat at Lake Champlain being towed. And look what the product is on uh, in your upper right hand corner. Okay. So. Oh, gee, what's happening here? The Great Awakening, the Burnt Over District, okay? And one reason why it was the Burnt Over District, well, it was called that, uh, and that wasn't called that until the autobiography of Charles uh, uh, Finney, okay? He gave it the title. And one reason for it, you know, when you had your crop, uh, farmers would burn, burn what was left uh, for, after the crop would go. And it was in order to create a fertile soil for your future crops. Okay, so you burned it, and it was ash after, and it became it became fertilizer, and it said pot, uh, pot ash, and, and what have you. So now you have all that. So that's how it got its name, because it was like the burnt over district. Now notice, part of, a lot of people think that the burnt over district was just in western New York, Madison County. Madison County was it? Why? Because People became all really excited about, oh man, religion! I'm gonna be saved! You're gonna be saved! But you gotta give something up! That's the only way you're gonna do it, Michelle! Oh, I'm sorry. Camille. Camille. <laughs> I was trying to not make you the name. I know who you are. Okay. okay. Shame on me. I'm going home. All right. But anyway. So, so there you are. Now, what about the Great Awakening? This was the second Great Awakening. And I'll show you to you in a little while. 1790 to 1840 was the heyday of the Great Awakening. Okay, so it's gonna produce new ideas. People are gonna to go to these camp meetings. They're gonna, oh, hallelujah! You know, the whole business. It's, it's all gonna be there. Now, what about Canastota at that time? Okay, Canastota, you know, was incorporated in 1835. Canastota was basically started in 1810. Reuben Perkins, a damn Yankee from Connecticut. Okay. Now, what's Canastota like? Well, somebody quoted, and uh, I'm trying to figure out where I got that quote from, but Canastota was a canal town in those days, uh, uh, which it all implies. We fought and gambled, stole each other's wives <laughs> and husbands, okay? Uh, and truth to canal traditions, and also drank strong liquor, okay? Uh, churches came along with it. Ah, churches came along with it. There's got to be a reason why churches came along with it, okay? And you know the reason. Now, there's all, all kinds of ways, you know, you convey an idea. And uh, so here's the blackboard, you know, the old teacher thing. Uh, they draw, used to draw the blackboard, now they got smart boards and big boards, and all you gotta do is point and things come up. Well, back in my day, that doesn't tell me, Camille, how old I really am. Okay, yeah, I forgot. 
Okay? But you would have, if you wanted to teach something, you would use the blackboard. Remember I talked about ways to convey an idea. So now here's another way of conveying an idea. The second, the second Great Awakening, 1790, basically you had two different dates. The historians always come up with dates that they think is going to be the, the, the idea here, right? And so you got to kind of compromise sometimes, depending on what you know. But offshoots, okay, you had, because of the canal, you had reform movements. You had new religious movements, new religions. Some of the older religions took a hit. Culture changes all the time. Religions change all the time. People attend different churches for different reasons, or maybe don't go to church for different reasons. So this is all happening here. A period of religious revival, though. People became very religious. Religious, Christian religious. Which is going to make a difference in the way you think about other people sometimes. About what's going on here. Okay? You had the, the canal really made for a market revolution. People buy, sell for commerce and, and all that. So that's going to be an offshoot here. And of course, social changes. Your values are going to change, your norms are going to change, your ideas are going to change, your knowledge is going to change all the way through this because of the Great Awakening. Now come back to Canastoya. And just notice this. Now, one of our Founding fathers, so to speak, okay, was Thomas Barlow. Judge Thomas Barlow. Judge Thomas Barlow moves to Canastota in basically 1831. And so he comes to Canastota and he's going to open up a law office. Notice how he how he decided where people could find his law office. <laughs> the brick building opposite C.J. Perkins Tavern. You want to find a lawyer? You go to the tavern. He's across the street. <laughs> All right, there he is. And this, this is the silhouette of Mr. Barlow in a portrait which is hanging in the courthouse, uh, Madison County uh, Courthouse of, of Mr. Barlow. Ah, oh, social reforms. Now notice temperance is going to come along. And you know, typical, everybody tells women started. Yeah, women helped with it. There are a lot of men involved in it, a lot of preacher men involved in the temperance movement. Uh, mm -hmm. the temperance movement. Okay? But notice there's one famous sign Lips that touch liquor shall not touch ours. Wow. How <laughs> <laughs> to get a man? <laughs> to follow your rules, all right? <laughs> sure enough, all right. But this all came about at the same time when we had, you know, abolitionists, uh, the abolitionist movement, uh, we had the women's suffrage, utopian communities, Oneida community, mm -hmm. right, Joe? Right, Oneida community, all that was going around. Religious movements, wow, you couldn't tell. You know, established religions, as you said, took a hit. They took a hit because more non-doctrine -doc uh, type religions is what people wanted back then. So they, they stayed away from the Presbyterians. All right, they joined Baptist groups because it met their needs at the time. So things start changing in culture and along with religion and what have you. This comprised the Temperance Union was comprised of of a variety of social, political, and religious group. It joins in on everybody. And there almost no group could divorce itself from the temperance union. Now, do you all know how teetotalers got their name? Okay, I'm going to tell you. There's a place called Hector, New York, which is part of the canal system because it connects to the, uh, the Seneca Cuyuga Canal by Lake, Seneca Lake. And on the far side is a place called Hector. In 1818, Hector was one of the first to establish a temperance type union. Now, they did not want everybody because they would lose the cause if you said, you're all going to stop drinking. You're all going to abstain from hard liquors and and anything that's got alcohol in it, 
You're going to abstain from it. You hear me? They didn't want to do that because they knew they would lose. So they came up with the idea, it's okay to drink beer, okay to have a glass of wine, but it's not okay to do what you want to do. Okay to have for hard liquors. So you can take a halfway point there, all right? So now you signed up. You signed up with an oath. Now, if you were in complete, you wanted to abstain completely from all drink, next to your name was put a T. So it's a T. And that's what it was. And that's how it got its name. If you did not go with the whole thing, you were now what? Halfway. That's okay. But eventually, most temperance union organizations, one after another, appeared. One after another kept appearing. It became very popular. Okay? They wanted total abstinence. Did I say it right? Yes. <laughs> I'm glad we laughed about that with my wife because there's some words I have a tough time with. And I just say, if she's, if she, She's my coach. <laughs> and so, I, and so I practice that word over and over again. You see, sometimes, you know, based upon where we're from and culture, you have different ways of saying things. Well, I got a lot of different ways of saying things. <laughs> All right. Now, some other way of conveying the idea. This is a, believe it or not, Nathaniel Courier. Courier Nine guy, 1842. All right? So he does the, the drunkard's progress, taking from taking your first drink to your grave. That's what it's all about. All right? And that was one way of conveying an idea. It's one way of conveying an idea. There's all kinds of ways of conveying an idea. Oh, let's get back to Canastota. All right? What do we have in Canastota here now? OK, in Canastota, we had Garrett Smith. Oh, me. Peter Brook, Gary Smith? Yeah, Peter Brook, Gary Smith. Uh, Gary Smith was, was the only advocate. He was, you know, in Congress. He was the only advocate in Congress that was for Texas. 1854. The only advocate. When you feel alone, well, if you knew Gary Smith and you know anything about him, he didn't care. <laughs> he could be alone. This man had the moolah. This man had some influence. This man was a strict abolitionist. He knew what he wanted to do. So where do they meet? The Temperance Festival. We're going to call it a festival. <laughs> They're going to meet at the Toby House. And I'll tell you, basically, with Toby House, if you know where Jim Caldwell's uh, insurance office is, across from the, uh, back then, there was called Toby House. Toby House is a public house. Toby House being a public house, would serve because another name for saloon is public house. Mm -hmm. Okay, so what do you have here? They're going to meet Toby House. Well, if you're not going to serve something, you know what? Then Mr. Toby, okay, who owns the building. So they had the house at, at, at the house of Toby House, okay? He came to store it Thursday, February 17th at 6 o'clock p.m. There you are. What's the date? February 10th, 1853. Camp meetings. And that's the one thing. I'm talking about thousands of people. I'm talking about 10,000 people at one of these meetings. People from all over. Rural people. Wanted to be saved. Okay? And so part of the temperance movement, not only do we recruit people for religion, and for God and for Christ, because these were Christians, okay? Not only do that, but you're going to change the whole social order of things through these meetings, because these people are going to go out and give more. They're going to travel all over. Preachers, like Finney, they travel all over the place, okay? And they attract the people. You knew he was coming to town. He knew you were coming to Rochester. He knew you were coming to Syracuse. People gathered. People gathered not for just to talk, for days. These camp meetings lasted days. People pitched tents. They came in basic organizations. 
And so what happened? Locally, local people start passing rules. All right? You can't be with any so many miles if you're going to, you can't drink so many miles, you can't have food or drink or anything so many miles of the camp meeting. <laughs> so many miles is quite a bit. And local governments get involved. Oh, yeah, well, that's the law. All right? So they have temperance rules there. And what you see in the middle here is a document 1871, and it was a pledge. And part of the pledge was Abraham Lincoln's second inaugural address. And guess what it dealt with? You got it. Temperance. Drink. It's high spirits. Stay away from it. Abraham Lincoln. Okay. People signed that. And not only did they sign it, they got it. Got a copy of that. Take home. Hmm. All right. What happens here? We've got the Temperance Union. We got Carry Nation. All right. Let me say, you know, Carry Nation. You're going to change your name. Carry Nation. <laughs> you know, Nation. What it all meant, okay? And she, you know, wrecked the place. Okay. Now, you got to remember something about the Temperance Union. You don't have to remember if you don't want to. Okay. But something about the Temperance Union. They were mostly for getting rid of, not just cons consumption came last, because you get rid of the free people producing it. You get rid of the people, the politicians who support it. Yes, consumption. But if you read anything about them, even the uh, 18th Amendment to the Constitution, which is prohibition, Okay? They're not trying to get rid of consumption. They don't care about the consumer doing it. Let's get rid of transportation of it, the manufacturing of it. And you read that very closely, and that's basically what it says. All right, we get rid of, we get rid of that going along the line. But what we want to do is get rid of this saloon keeper. And you want to do, and there it is. Ah, beer. You know, with a lot of times you, you can start with beer and you're in trouble if you start with beer, because you're gonna move on. You know, it's like dope. <laughs> you know what I'm saying here. You take one thing, ah, I move on, I didn't get enough. Okay. Again, I'm not preaching to you. Go home and have a beer. <laughs> okay, but here it is. Now you see WCTU right here. Whiskey, wine, beer, and what's happening to the poor farmer now in the meantime during his temperance school? He's losing out, why? Because he can't sell his product. All those things that make whiskey, you know, potato, grapes, anything at all, wheat, <laughs> you're losing out, and you're losing out your neighbor. So I might as well join my neighbor. So it's going to grow. It's going to grow. Here's one I just, I, I, I thought about this this morning, and then uh, we had, you know, now, I don't mean to insult anybody, so just, this is history, okay? But the KKK and the WCTU basically helped each other out. They each, each gave money to each other. We don't read that about the history books, okay? Matter of fact, the KKK, what pleasure. Women, temperance women, joined both. Many did. Not in this area necessarily, but yet you, you had different chapters. But nationally, they became one and the same. And you could almost read it. One and the same. Okay? But you have to research that out to, to prove it. And there you see the women, temperance women, in the Klan. Because they had the same ideas. People don't know this, but the Klan was temperance. They were anti-drinking. Yeah, they were anti-immigrant. Why? It was so many of the WCTUs were anti-immigrant. Why? Because what did the anti-immigrant bring over? Drink. One big thing. They were anti-Catholic, for the most part. Promoted Protestant religions because of the immigration thing here. Okay? But that's history. That's, that's part of history. But one thing that struck me was 
our history books and our history leaves out blacks. The black movement. You had you had started with, almost started with Frederick Douglass, Du Bois, uh, Ida Wells. There was the black population, and they were strong with temperance, but you don't read about it. Because anytime we do read about it, we see Victorian women who are progressing here, you know, well-to-do people who are making the changes and help make the changes, and they're not, they're not the only ones. What I'm trying to say is here, all society was involved in the temperance union you movement. Okay, finally, the magic lantern. <laughs> all right, this is not finally either, but, but there's the magic lantern. We own a magic lantern in our, in our museum. We had glass slides that goes in. It was the slide projector of the day. But the magic lantern dates way back to the 1600s. But it's going to be used with temperance movement. Because people are going to make slides. And how do you, how do you converse with people? You converse with people by showing them something. Get them excited. As a matter of fact, those slides for the companies that were making them were also making what they called moving machines. And I'm not talking about movies, I'm not talking about film type things. I'm talking, they called it moving machines because you see at the very bottom here, they had all kinds of like filters and so forth that they could change and make action. So I'm going to show you some slides that has to do with the temperance movement. Okay. So, now here's the slides that has to do with it. Now, up above there in the upper right corner here is the stereo optics. Stereo optics made magic lanterns, which they called moving machines. And the person who made this particular slide I'm going to show you is a man by T.J. McAllister. These are his slides. And I'm showing you not through a magic lantern, See how times change, the way to it? I'm showing you this old so-called PowerPoint. So, here we have it, and here you see them being projected on the, sc on the screen here. This is the one we had in Kansas uh, Canal Town Museum. And it's behind glass, of course, okay? But you see, we have, we have a whole collection of slides. Now, the one put out by the New York State Education Department is the, they call it the escarpment of, of, from Canastota. And if you were seeing this through a magic lantern and that slide was put in, it would look like this. And that was the magic lantern type thing that just moved out. That would be able to do it. That's what it looks like. Okay? So, there we are. It's a view of the north over the level country from the escarpment southeast of Canastota. Education Department. Mm -hmm. Now, because we had Marvin and Kessler and the biograph that was started here, you know, and all those kinds of things, newspapers, our local newspapers, start saying, why don't we start putting these machines in our schools? Canastota. And so, we found a newspaper article, 1907, saying, hey, come on, Kansas Story. You can get these guys to make the machines and we can put them in and we can start educating our kids one way or the other. Not one way or the other, but this way. So, what do we have? We're going to have a book that's going to be called The Dry Bible of the Temperance Movement. The Dry Bible. Okay, and what is he called? This is what got me started about this. Ten Nights in the Bar Room by Timothy Shea Arthur. There's no illustrations in the original book, none. But it reads, it's a melodrama. And it's going to talk about all the sins of hard spirits. And it's going to make you disgusted, okay, with the characters in it. In the book, is, I forgot how many pages, I should have, should have remembered that. But I, I think it's a thick book. Anyway, 
I might have let you go. That temperance book sold more than Harry Beecher Stowe's Old Times Cable. And it kept selling. And not only the book, but what it did, and I'll show you that, it came in other forms. There's the book. And that's where the I, the, out of that book came the term demon rum. That's where the term started. From that book, the dry Bible of it. And I say the dry Bible of it because you're going to see how it's going to be coming here. Now, originally I had a script, and I don't to take time to read the script to you, but I'll tell you something was happening. There's all kinds of characters in these slides. Bad people. Some good people, but bad people. And they're all gonna all gonna fall to demon rum, to hard spirits. Okay. There's a place, this man, if you read the book, and you look at you look into the book, you find that this man who was gonna own uh, the sickle and chef, 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 yeah. Uh, chef is the grain, the stalks of grain binds the other. Okay. He was the, originally he um, uh, owns a mill, grain mill. Okay, he decides to go into the tavern business. Okay, so he buys this big place. And he's he's going to do something. It's all going to be good, well, well. Things aren't going to end up so well for him. Okay, so now we have a traveler, and this is going to take place over a ten-year period of time. And I can't basically do what the book does or what this does. But I'll tell you what, something's going to happen in each slide. When he first gets there the first year, it's a very peaceful area. Everything looks pretty good, you know. But he does notice that uh, in the bar room, uh, Mr. Slay, Simon Slay's 12-year-old uh, son is taking any drinks that are left over, mixing them together and drinking. Twelve years old. He notices that. He noticed that the man's wife is not mentally all there. And the man has a family, Flora. His wife's name is Anne. And that's not too bad, right? But there's other characters they are being kind of boisterous in the bar. Now, what happens? A year passes. He's going to come back. Now, because of time, things are going to start changing there. And why are things going to change? Spirits. Our spirits. Okay. So, here we are. Joe Morgan is the town drunk. Joe Morgan is the town drunk. He spends all his time in the tavern. And his daughter, Mary, little Mary, comes and says, Father, please come home. Father, come home. And then the wife comes in too. And they, several times they have to take him home. He can barely stand up. But they take him home. They take care of him. All right? They still love Joe Morgan. Joe Morgan's dad. You got to love him. But he, they want him to change his ways. Okay? And in the meantime, there's other characters hanging around. There's a gangster. Gangster, what it means, the car shark. Okay? And then there's a crooked judge who's uh, taking money from the, mm, the people with the, the distilleries, okay? All right. The mill is going to be run now, in the book, is going to be run now by a man who's going to turn the mill into a distillery. Oh my gosh, you go for a nice mill, now you go into a distillery. So I'll slay the barkeeper tries to get Joe out of there, and he throws a glass, and he hits Mary in the forehead, and causes a gash. Mary's really hurt, badly. Okay, so, so Mary, he's got to go home. Just to try to get Joe, he accidentally hits little Mary, and Mary's home. And now, the third day, Mary's really at her deathbed. A doctor comes and sees them. The people in the 
the, the people in the bar room, I, I get nervous because little Mary, the daughter of Joe Morgan, is in bad shape. Okay? At this time, he starts having shakes, and you know, he's delirious. And he's he's going he's going a little off off the rocker. So his wife, she's gonna run for help. Wait a minute, like we can't control him at this particular time. I'm trying to be melting for a minute. <laughs> Not that good so what happens? The fourth day is the death of Joe's Joe. <laughs> I said Joe. Yeah, it's Joe. Okay, Joe. Oh, gee. Joe uh, Morgan, daughter dies. And upon her deathbed, she says, please, Father, stop drinking. Please, Father, stop drinking. There's a whole big thing here. And he promises her. And she takes her last breath. Father, yes, Mary, I will stop drinking, Mary. Whoa! Five years pass now before the narrator is going to come back. So I got five years, five calendar years here. Okay, he's going to come back, and there's five time, and things change through time. And sometimes it doesn't take very long for things to change. So he comes back to this place that originally was pretty good, just a few problems. And we see Frank Slade, the son now, five years later. He's now 17 years old, right? And he's takes a wild court, a championship horse, and he runs it into the ground with one of his so-called buddies, all right? And there he is with a bottle. There's more to this, but I'm not going to go through it all with you. <laughs> and now we, sign, we see Willie Hammond. Now, Willie Hammond uh, is induced to gamble. Now, he's drinking and he's gambling. His father is the capitalist of the period. But he's running his father into the ground with debts. He is not very good. Father's trying to go. And you know, with, with something about Willie, Willie, before he started drinking, was becoming a lawyer. He was studying law. He stopped studying law. Oh, goodness gracious. So he's drinking with a bunch of guys, and they're having a, uh, they're having a card game. Oh, card game. They're drinking. That's the sixth night he's introduced. And then somebody's accused of cheating. And so what happens is Harvey Green, he's the bad guy. Harvey Green gets out a knife and stabs him in the chest. Kills him. Oh, what wicked would do here? Okay? And then we got all these people going on. What's going on? There's a saving. Things are starting <laughs> to fall apart. And here we are, the eighth night. And in the eighth night, Simon Slade is having an argument with his son. An argument with his son. But he's retained from doing anything about it. Please don't do this. Meanwhile, we got some of the same characters involved here. They're all in there. Uh, night passes. And we go on to the ninth night. The argument between father and son still did not disappear. Oh, something terrible. So 17-year-old Frankie picks up a, a bottle, you know what was in that bottle, and throws it at his dad. Kills him. He killed his father. The tenth day, there's a meeting of citizens in the bar room. And they're meeting and meeting and meeting. And they finally decided we've had enough of this stuff. By the way, the people who did the killings and so forth, they were, they were dragged away by a mob. These people lost, lost themselves. And they beat them, mutilated them. And all that happened, it's in the book. 
All they had, boy, oh boy, oh boy, oh boy. Okay? And they're talking about, we got to get rid of the high spirits in this, in this place. So let's do it. All right? We're going to buy everybody out, and we're going to get rid of this, and we're, we're going to get rid of this bar. It's going to go. And it does. There's the legal proceedings, and Simon, you know, the hope the family loses everything. Everybody lost. Everybody's a loser in, in this game. But the man doing the speech, you want to guess who he is? Somebody guess who he is. The man who says we got to get rid of demon rum. The farmer. Who? The farmer. Joe Morgan. I didn't know. Yep, Joe Morgan. That's pretty good. Joe Morgan is going to get up and say, we've got to change because he's repentant. Okay. He's repentant. He promised his daughter he would, and that did it. He did it, because that was his daughter's deathbed. <laughs> and there, that's the speech. And so before we know it, goodbye, goodbye the tavern, the sign's coming down, and the community's going to be changing for the best. Mm -hmm. All because all the stuff happened. And if you read parts of the book, and you read the stuff I originally put down, it would take me a while to do it, but I, I didn't do it. So, let's move on here, though, because there were other ways. That's the glass slide that shows the, the idea of drinking. First of all, the son says, Dad, stop drinking. And then comes a neighbor. He said, I beseech you, stop drinking. This is all in movement, though, remember now. Glass slides. And the police officer says, okay, you're breaking the law, you're drinking, okay, I'm coming to get you. I made slides to, to make movement, but it would take me too long to show you. And then the cat goes, <laughs> Even animals are scared of this person. And the kids are going, <laughs> Charles 
Gilpin, the first black man to star in a Broadway play, making his debut 10 nights in a bar room. That's where he started. And that was good, but then again, he's gonna go into the movies. And he's gonna do a silent movie, 10 nights in a bar room. Okay, and it versus the, the, the talking. So here he is, the 10 nights in the bar room. And that was the, the plaque they put up for the movie. At the, 10 nights in the bar room. In Colored Players Film Corporation Production. Now remember the times, remember the dates. 1926. 1926. And then it's made into a uh, talking 1931. But well, other people start doing it. You know, cowboy singers. You know, ten nights in a bar room, and where do you think you're going? You know, and singing that song local. Okay, and now it became on Broadway. It became some. You know, you thought Hamilton was. You know, black players. Well, on Broadway early, you get black and white players playing the parts, and people accepted that. And now you're, you're, you're talking early, and there's a, a cast of just all white people, 10 nights in the bar room. Here is the movies, Here's the, here it is all put together. You're talking, 10 nights in the bar room, you see the flames there, the guys will lose his business. Now, 10 nights in the bar room, guess where it also was? Canastota. Of all places, the play. It was going to be at the Spencer Street School, the high school. On top, the very top floor of the high school was called Academy Hall. Academy Hall. And that's where they did plays. And who did it? The Reese's Post, the Grand Army of the Republic, GARs, okay? The past, you know, American Legion type. And they, they practiced and practiced and practiced in 1882. They did the play. On the top floor of the school that burned down in 1949. Now, let's go to Kansas State a bit and make a big right here. Some of this stuff came. There's, there's a gentleman here, David. Raise your hand, Dave. You know what? Okay. <laughs> There it is, but anyway, they sent me news clippings from old newspapers. So I took some of Dave's uh, news clippings. Okay, and there we are. And here's, here's one. Canastota, Madison County, 1877. Canastota drinks $20,000 worth of whiskey and beer annually. There's another one, sometime between 1882 and 1885. It is said that Canisota has 22 saloons, or about one for every 90 inhabitants. And then we get this, the Canisota Community Club, made up of no licensed advocates. No licensed advocates was another name for a temperance organization. No licensed advocates. Okay. And uh, it can be stored at least at, at the uh, a rental fee of $720. And he did it in the Too Good House. The Too Good House, who was serving liquor, now becomes a temperance hotel. Okay, the Too Good House is where the corner uh, drugstore was, okay? Mm -hmm. It's empty now. Okay. So that was the Too Good House. Across the street was the Doolittle House. So you had the Too Good and the Doolittle. <laughs> Those were actual family names, but okay. So you had the two girls, and across the street, 1887, May 4th, 1887, mass meeting of the community. And it's going to be held in the Doolittle House. Now, what do you think that mass meeting was going to be about? Temperance. You got it. So there, there's that one. Churches were holding the meetings, okay? Uh, here we have the Methodist Episcopal Church, and they had meetings there. And, and famous preachers, uh, ministers, would come to talk. And the church gets filled. 
and beyond filled, standing room only, in Canastota. This is a funny one. I, I took this and just expanded it a little bit, with your permission. <laughs> okay. Wait, I got a big kick out of this. Uh, the gold cure was a cure that could be sold for almost anything. In other words, we could cure anything. Take our medicine and take our massages and take our counseling and we could cure you. Okay, this gentleman, Charles M. Rosa, proprietor of the Canastota Gold Cure, has purchased Samuel uh, de Torres Saloon in the village and is now prepared to fur furnish his own customers for the cure. <laughs> he bought a saloon. He went out of business for the other one. He buys a saloon because that's where the money is. Okay. This, this cure business is not doing me any good, so he buys the saloon. And by the way, the, 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 that was, the store they also bought were one of our two cigar makers in Canastota. So cigars and the whole business. You gotta be a man, you know, you gotta smoke a cigar and you can spit it out the whole thing. Okay, there we go. And that, that was taken from other newspapers. Thank you. Okay, dry, dry. Harold. April 5th, 1908. Almost done. I had to include Watson. You know, people, people call me Mr. Watson Wagon uh, type guy. But Mr. Watson was one who was part of all this temperance movement. And he spotted a young boy carrying beer, you know, in the bucket. That's not the picture of the real boy, but it's the one I could find. Okay? And he spilled it, drink. Oh my goodness gracious, my. So this, and the miner, and you, uh, how good the keeper uh, was indicted for selling beer to a miner. It was tried, paid the fine. But it was Mr. Watson who turned him in. How dare somebody let a kid carry wine home from the saloon, from our public house. So there's Mr. Watson, there's a Watson wagon. Uh, picture at the bottom because it was the first one of the first of the bottom dump wagons. Okay? And that's Mr. Watson next to his original wagon up on top. I always got to include Mr. Watson or something. Okay. Now, I had the good fortune of meeting the descendants of Claude uh, Barker. Claude Barker's family gave me his writings about his memories of Kansas story. He moved out of here in 1916. Yeah. And then he comes back in 1972. And I like, I like reading his material because he tells something about Kansas Store, each one of them. And he mentioned the bar rooms. According to him, he said, well, no one had to go thirsty who lived in, Kansas, who lived in or near Kansas Store. To the best of my memory, well, we had somewhere around 15 bars in the village. And that was around 1916, to the best of his memory. I won't go through that. He named a few of them. About 1910, we, call, we, we put a thing. And at the bottom, in what we call Sanborn maps, I put a star next to some, uh, Peterborough Street. And you see the railroad tracks. We had six, six railroad tracks coming through here. The Lewis House, uh, the Lewis House is going to be where the Weaver Hotel was. Loose House is going to become the Weaver. Okay, the Weaver uh, is where the, uh, the village hall is right now. And the village of Town Hall. So just in that one block, you have one, two, three, four. Go across the street, you had three more. Now, come where Canastota was in this area. Same word maps. I, you see where the Canastota Canal Town Museum is? At that time, it was a bakery. Okay? Just in that block, one, two, three, four, five saloons. Just go next door, you have another saloon. Go down, two more doors down, you have another saloon. Go next to the grocery store, you have another saloon. And then, but things start to go, going, going back in 1905. Now, uh, 
here we are, a whole bunch of persons. This is another one he gave me, all right, which I, I it took for a minute. And we got a big kick out of this uh, because uh, they were serving drinks. Uh, and this was during a Christmas party, apparently, to minors and to women and girls uh, and boys, as well as men, who frequent the sitting room adjoining the bar. And so I, I found a picture of a whole bunch of women who might have been there. <laughs> That's Canada, 1905. Yeah. yeah, how about that? All right. And the next one I got a big kick on, we all know what the blue laws are. You couldn't buy or sell alcohol and drinks or some other products too at the time. But here's this guy, Ralph, <laughs> who, uh, he, he's the owner of a, a bartender in the candy store, in the candy store saloon. And here's a name everybody's going to know, Brophy. Okay. <laughs> Okay, so we're going back in time. Any brophies here tonight? Okay. The name's still there. Okay, so here, here we are, and we, we've got it going. But at any rate, there was a whole number. The grand jury returns five against canister liquor dealers. And what did they do? They broke the blue laws at the time. Okay, the year is 1914. All right? Now, I got a big kick out of Frank Waldo. By the way, the Waldo fan is going to be part of it. Mr. Waldo is going to become the mayor. Okay. But anyway, Frank Waldo, uh, proprietor of a resort <laughs> at Canal Street, was indicted for having a alleged secret door connecting to the, to the grocery store. <laughs> Why was there a secret door there? Okay. At any rate, this is what was going on at the time. And that was 1914. World War I going on. Mm -hmm. And then here's another one. Uh, we, we go here. Ne notice, next time you ate, we're going to go there. Okay? And that building still basically exists, but not in its present form, not in that form. All right, so we had Mr. To Toshi, uh, Toshi, Toshi, uh, only, only a bar room, he's going to build another place. And that's what this. That's what all this is about. But now, 1916, individual played before prohibition when dry. Canistota when dry. Locally, you could do that. Local places did it. They go dry. Canistota became dry. All right? So, <laughs> guess what they found in this place? Horribly conducted a saloon. Seized about 40 gallons of liquor, including wine, whiskey, and beer. <laughs> all right. So, all right, and they used to serve uh, Bartels. Now, we can't start with dry, and I got a big kick out of this one. And <laughs> Canistone's first dry Saturday was marked by a heavy increase in the sales of rail tickets for <laughs> O'Neill. <laughs> The total over 300. <laughs> Ordinarily, about 100 were sold that Saturday for the night. This is the third rail, the trolley type thing. All right. And so I, I found I found a ticket from Canistota to Oneida. I, I got the biggest kick out of this one. You know, and this is reported to be a, a Swigo farmer <laughs> in the same month that we've been dry. So right away, people from Canistota says. <laughs> I'm not going dry. I'm going to Oneida. Oneida wasn't dry yet. <laughs> and there's the document. And there's the third rail they took. And just, just to kind of end all this, okay, there's a raid in the hotel in Canastota. At the time, I took a, 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 out of the book, I took a, uh, this lady who's coming across the border now, prohibitions in, in effect. And she stopped carrying this bottle. And he said, well, I got, I got, I got a bottle of water here. And, uh, and the inspector, the agent says, well, I have to see it, man. And he opened it up and he says, this is not a bottle of water. She says, what miracles will do. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, I can't prove it, but somebody said, uh, this has supposedly been in one of our Hotel, so I'm not even going to name the hotel because I don't know. But there was a federal raid and their prohibition, and I I don't have any 
definitely proved to say it was yeah. case yeah. somebody claims it was. So I'm not gonna say it was, but that things happened in there. Okay, here. And so we had prohibition 1919 to 1933. And then hallelujah, the end of prohibition. So folks, the idea of the Erie Canal with whiskey is still there. There's a company in Schenectady that produces uh, Erie Canal whiskey. They gave it names. Names of the number of barge, of number of blacks. They gave Bill Rope in one name, in one of their drinks. Black Rock, which was a competitor for a Buffalo of the Canal to start, and the Gateway. So, the true spirit of New York, the Erie Canal, and Moonshine. Still there, someone there. Mm -hmm. And then we move on, and in case any of you want to go home and take, I've got a recipe for you. And this is the recipe for, you take one barrel of Erie Canal water, and you mix it with two gallons of alcohol. And then you add two ounces of strychnine. By the way, that was a stimulant, too, besides being poisoned. Okay, because tobacco and tobacco to make them sick. Because if it wasn't, if you didn't drink hard spirits and you didn't get sick, it's not good enough. Okay, and then you take any canal that would figure it, it was whiskey, unless it made, unless it made you sick. Then you made five bars of soap to give it a head. Okay, and a half a pound of red pepper. Oh, okay, and then you put it in with some sagebrush and boil it until it's brown. No, gin's not brown, by the way. I was, okay, and you strain, and you strain it into the barrel, and what you got is canal whiskey. So now you all know the recipe. And if you want me to send it to you, I will send it to you the recipe so you can make one to make your very own. But you know the tradition of beer and alcohol is still there. This is part of our exhibit about uh, the brewery. The Erie Canal Brewery is here now. So, so. See, the past never dies. So here we are. And by the way, that's a beer truck in the uh, that fell into the canal right in front of our museum. Back there, it wasn't the museum, it was the press room. Okay. Yeah. And boy, did the people who came and said, oh, somebody forgot the truck. Get that beer out of there. <laughs> okay. And of course, we now have the Erie Canal Brewing Tap Room and Mosquito Pale Ale, and plus 17 other varieties of craft beers. And that, if, if you like a beer, it's a place to go. Those people are very nice, by the way. And that's the end. But remember, the past never dies. Thank you, folks. Yeah. There is, there is a, a group of, of Irishmen uh, who call themselves the pioneers. Uh, they, they've all taken a pledge to not let it okay. drop, you know, past the list. Yeah. So all of that. Now I'm wondering, now they have lapel pins and so forth and so on, and, and in some circles they're quite influential. Uh, I'm wondering if there's any connection between this group and uh, this temperance movement. How, I, I know they go back, right? I can't, I don't know how far back. I don't know, but they're the pioneers. Yeah, okay, I'll put in there. Well, yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Lake, by the way, here. <laughs> okay. Uh, any other question? Or, okay. You showed a yeah. map uh, of the saloons on Canal Street. We went as far as Souter. Of course, on the other side of Souter was Mon Paz. Yeah. And when the Fertini family moved up the street to open the restaurant, it was 1933, the end of Prohibition. Right. And apparently, they inherited a photo of a woman, a naked woman, who used to be on the balcony. And she would encourage the canal boat men to. Oh. <laughs> uh, that's, that's true. Okay. Lies and pies back in the day, not near the fa that family. No. We don't want to confuse people. Back in the day, yes, it was a saloon, but it was something else upstairs. Yeah. Okay. So, yes? Did you find oh, it? I didn't know who that was. <laughs> <laughs> I did. <laughs> I'm sorry. So, half our, our, we're half in disguise. 
Yeah, I don't understand it. Did you find anything in your research that, uh, about a lot of the um, motivation for women being involved with temperance was because of domestic violence? Because oh, yeah, that was, that, was, that was one of the major things. But I basically didn't say But that's, if you look at like the, the, the courier thing there, okay, the bottom, that was domestic violence. She was leaving the house because she was being abused by her husband. And, it, and that was a consistent theme. And that was a theme, and if they did the whole melodrama before you, that also was a theme. Uh, 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 Simon uh, abused his wife and that kind of thing. So there were all kinds of things going on that I couldn't possibly get to that. But I'm glad you asked the question. That was one of the major things. Thank you. Okay. I'm, yes? I moved here in 1963, early 63, and there were several places to get a drink when I moved here. Yeah. Not yeah. as many today. I, I don't know how many, but there were several corners that you could find a place to go. Yep, yeah, there were. And I moved here in 68. Uh -huh. and I came up with the same conclusion. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I belong to the Flat Earth Society. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> I, I belong to the Flat Earth Society. You know, after JC's broke up, I was a JC. JC broke up. Uh, Mark Lavonis, who was mayor here at one time, Mark and I were good friends. And we formed the, uh, uh, the Flat Earth Society so the guys could still get together. So we got together in Mass and Paz. And uh, so I'll tell you a story about me and Drink, okay? Uh, Nazi walk in and he's, he always said, hello, gentlemen, and you too, Joe. <laughs> <laughs> because <laughs> I didn't drink you know, all that, uh, that much, but that just tells you something about it. But there was the Flat Earth Society, you guys used to get together. And you all had beer, and that beer, you used to get a marker, and then you, you know, so you know everybody knows how cheap I am when I'm in the war. So I want to tell you, we all got. I got to tell this even a funny story, and we can go. But the, I, so we each got a marker, right? And it would, you know, you get nine markers, you know. Then it became my turn because I always ordered a ginger ale, and uh, so it, it came down to me. We all got markers. And I'd get all my markers and buy a round for everybody. <laughs> <laughs> buy markers. That's how cheap I am. <laughs> Folks, thanks for being here. <laughs>